Good morning, everybody. Ask me anything. What is it? May 4th, 2023. Got some good questions as usual. And I have a feeling because it's May 4th and for whatever reason, there's a bunch of people in the Lynchpin community that are Star Wars fanatics. I have a feeling that this is the day we're going to hear a lot of that, uh, that May 4th sort of talk. But anyway, we'll dive right in. We got some good stuff going on. Good questions. I've got them written down. I've got some bullet points to hit or whatnot. And let's go. So let's see. All right. Get my answers here. Okay. First one. First one's a good one. First one came out of the BTWB squads feature. And it is from Bruno C. And Bruno says, what is the most valid criticism of CrossFit you've ever come across? And what's your response? That's a good question. So the most valid criticism of CrossFit that I've heard probably is far too many people sacrificing form or technique in order to prioritize moving quickly, going fast, winning the workout, quote unquote, beating the clock and all that stuff. That's probably really high on the list. I would say that's pretty valid. And I feel comfortable saying that because I lived that life. If I look back on some really old videos when I started doing CrossFit back in 2005 with my knucklehead friends in our garage, we didn't have any idea what we were doing and we had nobody putting us on a good path. We thought we knew what CrossFit was. We did not, especially now looking back, we didn't know anything. Um, and we just were unfamiliar with the movements, but didn't really care about learning them. We just wanted to do them. Didn't seek out any coaching or training or videos or knowledge or education, none of that stuff. And just started ripping barbells around. Uh, that was stupid. That was really stupid. And that's probably people saw other people doing that, wearing a shirt that says CrossFit and goes, well, wow, that looks dumb and unsafe. CrossFit's dumb and unsafe. But, you know, I lived that life. What I was doing and how I was moving the barbell and how my friends and I were working out, that wasn't CrossFit's fault. That was my fault. There's this little thing called personal responsibility. And it was my fault in how I was moving. It was my fault for not learning. It was my fault for rushing into it. It was my fault for not reading the journal articles, seeking out education and actually figuring out what it was happening. But I did that stupid stuff for far too long, to be honest with you. And you know, that's a big part of what we're trying to do here is get people on a better path, a more intelligent path, a more sustainable path a lot earlier because you know, I was lucky that I didn't do anything stupid to myself. I just moved really inefficiently and poorly for a long period of time and all that did was blunt my progress and then when I actually pulled my head out of my rectum and figured out that I wasn't doing things properly and there was this thing called technique, etc, etc, well now I just had all these bad habits ingrained into my central nervous system that I had to rewire and that's inefficient and a pain in the butt so there was nothing good. I didn't do CrossFit any favors as a brand, so to speak, and I didn't do myself any favors by conducting and behaving like that for a while. So I would say that's probably it. Okay, you know, before we continue, can we just take a moment to talk about what happened yesterday with the back squats, the 15, 10, 5, that rep scheme? That was a... Um, that was an event. It was a personal event. Uh, a lot of self-talk, a lot of heavy breathing, a lot of uh, stamina required in that, but also uh, for the men and women in the linchpin community, the loadings that so many of you put up for all of those lifts blew my mind as some absolutely ridiculous loading. So Congratulations, well done. And then also really cool to see some people that somehow at the end of that, they did a 15 at whatever loading was appropriately challenging. They did a 10. And then when they got to the five, we had several people set a new five rep max. How does that make any sense? After doing a heavy 15 
and a heavy 10, they add like a kilo onto their lifetime PR of a five rep max and go ahead and, and do that. Blew my mind, so absolutely crazy. I'm actually, I'm actually feeling okay right now. So I think I made some good decisions with the loading and, and I pushed myself, but I didn't go to that deep, dark, crazy place and I feel okay right now. My wife makes me giggle a little bit. She decided to go for it. And even last night sitting on the couch, she was like, oh no, She's like, I'm already feeling my legs and it's not even the next day. And an evil smile just, just covered my face and she's like, how do you feel? And I said, I feel great. I feel absolutely great. Okay, so let's go. Next most uh, upvoted one, looking to improve running from Laura G. We all know that running is cool and awesome and fun and everybody should do it far more frequently. So let's see. Uh, oh, I'm on the wrong thing here. Stand by. I got to change screens here real quick. Sorry. Click on this. Let me click on the ask me anything questions. Okay, here we go. Now I'm where I need to be. All right. Okay, Laura G, where are you? Here we are. All right, let me expand the question and we're good. For those of us that need to improve our endurance with running, should we shorten the distance to be able to run without stopping or should we push ourselves into doing at least the scaled version with possible walking? This applies to workouts with multiple rounds of running. I don't want to shortchange myself, but I don't want to choose the easy way out either. Besides, hashtag running is stupid. <laughs> okay, so let's chat about this for a second. Let's take a, uh, let's just make a workout up on the spot and we'll use that because you said it applies to workouts with multiple rounds of running. We'll use that as a baseline to have this conversation. So let's say the workout of the day is four rounds for time of a 400 meter run, 12 deadlifts, 12 burpees. Okay, pretty straightforward. Doesn't matter what the loading is. 400 meter run, 12 deadlifts, 12 burpees. That's the prescribed workout of the day. Now maybe the scaled workout on a day like that <clears throat> would be very similar, but it would have reduced overall volume and it would probably, it could take out the 400 meter runs and just insert a period of time for which you're gonna to try to cover as much distance as you can, whether it's walking or jogging or any combination of the two. So a scaled version on that day could very likely be three rounds for time. We don't have the 400 meter run in there. It would be three rounds for time of, in a two minute window, walk or jog as far as you can, 12 deadlifts, 12 burpees. So that's what it would be. So first of all, almost no matter which one you choose, as long as it's not obnoxiously beyond your capacity and you're overreaching, it's going to help you. You know, if running is a weakness and you're out there doing some mixture of walking and jogging and maybe something like a scaled workout, it never existed, okay? Uh, you're not part of the private track, you're just following the free workouts every day on Lynchpin's Instagram or website and you're doing, you, all you see is the prescribed workout of the day and you're out there struggling through the 400s and you walk and jog and you walk and jog and they take you four minutes, let's say, to cover that 400 meters through a combination of walking and jogging. There might be a more ideal path for you to advance your running and improve your endurance, but if you continue doing something like that every time a 400 meter run pops up, little by little, just through repeated exposure and just through the fact that this is where you need to improve and this is a weakness, you're gonna wind up over that 400 meters walking a little less and jogging a little more, walking a little less and jogging a little more, and you know, improvement will come. But let's see, you know, is there maybe a more efficient path for you to be on? So like I said, first of all, no matter what you're doing, it's gonna help. I would say if you're trying to choose between those two, the prescribed or the scaled that has the set two minute window, what I would wanna know is if and when you do the prescribed version and you go and knock out those 400 meter runs through a combination of walking and jogging, are you doing more walking or are you doing more jogging? That would be an interesting thing to know. So out of that 400 meters, if you're walking 300 of it and only jogging 100 of it, in a case like that, I would say, yeah, let's not worry about the 400 right now. Let's move to something else like that two minute window 
because you're doing far more walking than jogging and that's you know by the time you walk back to the barbell you're you're cool down we don't want to have that happen you could also do something like a hybrid which might be uh, fun for you and so this is the point of these ask me anything's right because we lay out a, a workout of the day and then sure there's a wild card option and then there's a scaled option and then there's a limited equipment which is a dumbbell option then there's a no equipment at home zero gear option but like I've said before you could have five different options of a workout but if you have a hundred people doing them there's a good chance that one or two people raise their hand and be like yeah I'm just kind of in between option A and B what should I do now if you have 200 people doing them there's a chance a couple more hands are going up if you have several thousand people doing them there's a good chance that somebody's going to be you know in between a couple options which is why the knowledge component of having these conversations is so mission critical so you can look at what's happening look at the work of the day understand the various options understand where you are in your fitness journey and then if you need to make a little tweak you know that you're authorized to do it and you feel confident in doing it so a hybrid that might work out really well for you is let's say I'm going to assume you work out in your garage Let's say that you measure out with a measuring wheel your 400 meter run course and it's 200 meters out from your garage and it's 200 meters back and now a workout comes up that's got 400 meter runs in it then what you could do is during the workout you're going to do that you're just going to move for two minutes and see how much distance you cover you're going to make your way out towards what's eventually that 200 meter mark but you're just going to go out towards it for one minute because you're doing it for a two minute window see how far you get turn around and come back and that's through a combination of walking and jogging well then what's really cool if you're doing it on that set course and you're always doing it for two minutes over the course of a couple months there's a good chance that you're going to see your turnaround points maybe never get to that 200 meter mark because again you're setting yourself up you know at the one minute you're turning around but over the course of a couple months you're going to see that you're making it further and you're making it further and you're making it further that in and of itself right there is indicative of progress and I would do that for a few months and make sure that you are making progress just like that now what you could do after a few months as you creep and creep and creep and creep a little bit further each time is now instead of giving yourself a two minute window give yourself a two minute and 30 second window and now you're going to be exposing yourself to a little bit more time out there walking and jogging but you have built up to that that'll be a good thing and now you'll make it a little bit further because if you're doing it for two and a half minutes you're going to go out for 75 seconds then you're going to come back you're going to go out you're going to come back and after a few months of doing that you could probably extend that window to a three minute window where you're going to go out for 90 seconds and back for 90 seconds and when you get to that point where you're giving yourself about a three minute window i think you could hold steady right there with the goal of trying to eventually make it to that 200 meter turnaround point and come back in about that three minute window I think that's a good place to be because I wouldn't want to have somebody going much further than that regarding the amount of time they're out there running jogging or walking if we're talking about a multi-round workout or something like that so I would choose any one of those modifications I think would work really well for you to include those hybrids you know there's also something that might serve you well not to get off on a tangent here but when sprint days come up or track days come up whether it's 10 by 100 meter runs 8 by 200 6 by 400 3 by 800 whatever it happens to be we've mentioned this before and we've done a, a full video on this i want to say it was called uh, something about like rest periods during interval based training i think that's what it's called rest periods during interval based training we did a linchpin conversations on that based upon a CrossFit Journal article of the same name that occurred and the cool thing about that was that again once you understand the stuff you can modify workouts to fit your needs so if you're doing a 6 by 400 meter track day so to speak in general you can modify that same workout based upon whether you as an athlete need to work on your speed or do you need to work on your stamina so for example if you have decent endurance you can just seem to go and you can jog and you can jog and you can jog but you're not very fast anytime you have to push the pace well then on a day like that you know uh, the 6 by 400s or the 8 by 200s you need to work on your speed you would want to take a good big rest period between those running intervals 
so that you actually have recovered enough to really try to push the pace the next time the next interval comes up. On the opposite side of the fence, if your speed is decent but you just don't have any endurance, right? Pretty good at sprinting but you just crash and burn on longer runs, you would want to do the opposite. You would crunch down those rest periods so you're not taking a lot of rest between each interval so that it's forcing you to build your stamina more than your speed. You're actually intentionally allowing yourself to recover a bit less. But all that is, you know, we had a full chat about that in that other linchpin conversation. So you might want to go ahead and, and check that out as well, just to have some more uh, info floating around your head there. Okay, next most upvoted question. This is from Joseph G. Any non-athlete that I would like to interview in the CrossFit space? So yeah, that's his question. Is there any non-athlete you'd like to interview in the CrossFit space? Other podcasts, hosts, product developers, things like that. Um, overwhelmingly so, the answer is no. Overwhelmingly so. Uh, not that there's not interesting folks out there in what you just mentioned right there, but no one, no one pops to mind. Yeah, well, there might be one person, but no one, no one pops to mind. What I actually find more interesting is all of you, like the people in the, in the linchpin community, quite frankly, I, I find there's a lot of amazing stories that would keep me busy interviewing the linchpin community for years and years, which is actually why, you know, for the last few Tuesdays, when I do the Tuesday um, Instagram live, I think for the last three weeks in a row, it's been a, an interview with a member of the linchpin community. So if you are a member of the Lynchman Private Track and you're down for having one of those Instagram live conversations to get to know you for about 15 minutes, as I've said before, shoot me an email at info at CrossFitLynchman.com, put a little bit of your story in there, and then I have a folder in my Gmail for that. Uh, I haven't responded to everybody yet because there's a lot of emails in there, but I'm just making my way through. Don't worry, I got it. And I'll, I've, I mean, I've set for at least the next couple of years of emails, but um. I want to hear from everybody because let's let's think about this for a second. Yesterday in the private track and on the uh, the Facebook group and in the Beyond the Whiteboard squad, we asked the question of what does everybody do for a living? And it's so fascinating. I'm going to open it up right now and just read a couple of these and then this will maybe help illuminate why I don't have to go anywhere else to find interesting stories and fascinating people to interview. Real people doing amazing things all around the world and they all have a story to share. And I was actually thinking, I don't know if this would bore somebody to tears or not, of doing some sort of an interview, or maybe I would just, not an interview, a video, where I would just say people's first names, you know, to keep some sort of anonymity if that's what they wanted, and read down the list of what everybody does. It's so fascinating and be like, this is the linchpin community. Talk about a huge, wide-ranging variance and diversity of people and occupations. It's crazy. I mean, I'll read a couple right now. So what do we got here? Let's see. We've got um, family-owned heating and cooling company, uh, a vet tech, chief technology officer for a startup, uh, engineer that manages a team of network engineers for the Navy and Marine Corps. Um, work for Cisco Systems, realtor, mechanic, uh, mechanical slash aerospace engineer, uh, real estate agent, a fire captain, physical therapist, family physician, work, somebody who works in renewable energy, managing wind and solar farms, a merchant marine, another fire captain, CEO for a skilled nursing and assisted living facility family doctor, dental hygienist, physical therapist, analytical chemist for a nutrition department at a university, foreign language correspondent, uh, founder of a real estate tech startup, paralegal, fire engineer, financial planner, uh, another physical therapist, somebody who works in corporate finance, manager of an IT team, back-end software developer, um, customer quality engineer at a tier one automotive company. We make, um, my company produces every Tesla steering column. I mean, these are fascinating to me. A clinical psychologist specializing in adult autism diagnosis. Wow. I mean, just from everyone that I've already read, and there's 
so many responses, they just keep scrolling and scrolling down. I mean, there's all the fascinating interviews you'd ever want to hear. And I, I don't know if some of these people couldn't discuss things for client, you know, uh, privacy, things like that. Maybe they could speak in vagaries, but I mean, clinical psychologists specializing in adult autism diagnosis. I mean, talk about important work. And I bet there's just so many interesting things to pick that person's brain about that would keep me occupied forever. Uh, quality control, lead pharmacist, medical research, strength and conditioning coach for the U.S. Army, another physical therapist, United States Marine, diesel mechanic, forklift operator, cardiothoracic surgery physician's assistant. Um, and now I'm getting back into the OR to learn robotic lung surgery. Right, that sounds plenty interesting for an interview right there. Uh, what else do we have here? Fire marshal in the Bay Area in California, medical billing specialist, another firefighter, chemical engineer, MRI technologist, um, admissions department at a children's psychiatric hospital. That would be fascinating as well. Absolutely fascinating. Elementary school teacher, sustainable aquaculture. I'm not even, I don't even know what that is personal financial planning, aerospace engineer. I mean, not to, I don't know, hopefully it's not boring anybody. I could just go on and on and on. I mean, this is absolutely fascinating to me. So when I think about finding people to interview that have interesting stories and all that, I just don't really see the need to go anywhere else. I mean, the linchpin community we've got, and there's also, I didn't get to there, but we also have like multiple people who are farmers for a living. I mean, we've got everything from farmers to surgeons and aerospace engineers and everything in between. Holy cow, it's crazy. Okay, you distracted me. That was your fault, not my fault. Okay, here we go, so let's see. Um, I also had somebody contact me via Instagram, who I won't uh, say who they are now because I want to remain anonymous, but it was like the, the mayor of a major city. It's like in loves following Lynchman stuff and we're going to do a Zoom call and I'm going to get, a, get to just pick this person's brain about being the mayor of a major city. Like that's fascinating to me. I don't know if that will ever have the ability to turn into an actual interview, but again, I just don't, don't need to go anywhere outside the Lynchman community for a very, very long time. Okay. Let's go to the next most upvoted question. Final question here. This is from Colin J. Doing some scrolling. Where is Colin? Where is Colin? Okay, here you are. Here you are, Colin. Okay. Ah, gotcha. So Colin's question is about basically only doing CrossFit and then playing a sport and basically straining something. And he gives the example of, you know, he was playing some indoor soccer and strained his groin. And so basically, you know, is is doing CrossFit going to amply prepare you to just dive into a particular sport? Great question. So, and I know we've covered it before, but we'll dive into it here as well. So what I've got here, what popped into my brain was that, you know, CrossFit is, in my humble opinion anyway, <clears throat> It's the most effective and efficient strength and conditioning program that I'm aware of for, from a minimalist approach. And it does most certainly prepare your body globally on a large scale to be ready for an insanely wide variety of tasks and challenges. And if you think about it, we go below parallel, we pull from the ground, we go overhead, we do body weight movements, um, you know, like air squats, we do lightweight, moderate weight, heavyweight, we go short, medium, and long, we do calisthenics, we do power lifting, we do Olympic lifting, we do sprints from short to running long, we bike, we row, holy cow. And we also put in agility drills a couple times a week after the warmups if people want to go ahead and, you know, do those as well. But the thing is, you still need to do the thing. Um, Oh, cool. Somebody just posted here. I was in the best shape of my life while doing linchpin, um, going for firefighter recruiting training. Very cool. Awesome. But the thing is, you still need to do the thing, 
whatever the thing happens to be. And maybe the thing is indoor soccer or the thing is basketball or whatever. You know, the funny example that I give is, you know, Glassman used to say every now and then, if you were like a mixed martial art fighter and you come to me for a training, like I can give you your strength and conditioning foundation for your sport, but you could still get into the ring and get knocked out because I don't know how to teach you how to fight. Um, and also something like MMA would probably be a great example as well. Like CrossFit could be your strength and conditioning base, but while I don't do MMA myself, I have a feeling that there are certain positions and movements and strain that your body is going to experience that I almost can't replicate in the strength and conditioning program when somebody's torquing on your shoulder and pulling it behind your body and you're trying to resist that or your leg or your ankle or your knee, you know, moving in in a thousand different bizarre directions that you have to go and actually do the thing, the sport, the activity, whatever it is. And CrossFit is just your strength and conditioning program that allows you to go ahead and do that. And then your body is going to be the recipient of unique stressors during that sport or activity. And then ideally you enter that sport or activity in a crawl, walk, run approach to get your tendons, your ligaments, your joints, your whatever it happens to be gradually adapted to the stressors of that particular sport. But CrossFit could be your base layer of strength and conditioning to set you up for as much, as much success as humanly possible, but you still have to go do the thing that makes sense. Same with baseball you could, or, or any sport. You know, you could be fit, strong, have lungs for days and never be able to swing and hit a fastball. You got to do the thing. And I think the MMA example of actually the stress in your joints is a really good one. My boys play basketball all the time. That's their sport. I watch them every single solitary weekend. And whatever your strength and conditioning program is, you get out on the basketball court and there's going to be nothing quite like the demands of a full-blown 100% intensity. We're playing for real game. The starts, the stops, the pivots, like over and over and over and over again. You've got to go out there and actually do the darn sport. And I've got friends that we've actually interviewed on, um, like on the Very Not Random podcast, or collegiate strength and conditioning coaches that would tell you the exact same thing. They're going to prepare their athletes in the gym as best as possible, but those athletes need to go out onto the field to really do the thing and get their body ready for the demands of that unique sport. So you got to 100% do that. And it even happens like we live on some property here. We've got some wind that rips through and some trees that come down every now and then. So every, every couple months I'm out there with a chainsaw just cleaning up the yard and the property. I do all the CrossFit and deadlift and stuff that I want and I get out there with a chainsaw for three to five hours, chopping up trees, dragging around the pieces, carrying them around, moving them. I'm wiped out and sore in unique places like, like I don't spend every day of my life working out because it's not something that I do every single solitary day. But if I had repeated exposure to that, I'd be good to go. Um, so let's see, you know what also you might find very useful on this subject is we actually did a very not random on the topic, pretty much on the topic, very not random number 99, which is entitled, does CrossFit make you less athletic? And I think you will find that to be a, a fun and interesting topic. So that should be that fantastic questions. Thanks everybody. Um, and again, wow. Great work on, on the back squats the other day. The five, the tens, and the fifteen, excuse me, fifteens, the tens, and the fives absolutely blew me away. And you know, there are certain people in the community that when things come out, you associate them with that activity. For example, there's going to be what is today? Thursday. Tomorrow, not to let the cat out of the bag, but there is a um a bit of a long run coming up tomorrow. Anytime that a run comes up, you know, we, maybe we associate that with, with Melanie. You know, she's one of the ones that is always waving the running is cool flag amidst the sea of people saying that running is stupid. Well, so we're going to probably associate that with her. Well, when those heavy squats came up, yeah, you think heavy squatting, you think Tanner, right? And Tanner, my goodness, his set of 15, his set of 15 was at 405 pounds. He did that for a set of 15. What 
in the world, which is funny. Like he always says, you know, this may not be a specific strength bias program, but it will make you strong. So just trust the process, respect the heavy days, and enjoy the long run tomorrow, everybody. <laughs> I do it because I care. Scale if needed, you know, to whatever distance or time domain makes sense for you. And we'll talk soon.